All right. Check one, two. Got the mic. Hopefully it has some audio here coming up. And let's go. All right. Oh, more people showing up. All right. If uh, I'll say it again. If you haven't muted your mics in the background, please do so. It will help from our distraction, etc. And let's get going. So uh, obviously the last two labs we've been kind of talking about... Uh, immersive speaker systems uh, and that kind of deployment uh, and, you know, kind of what's involved in all that kind of this. I, I don't want to, you know, I, it's it's hard for me to call it a new thing. I, I know there are companies that have been doing this for a long time, but in terms of doing it for music, right, for music production, it is still relatively new. This has been going on in theater, object-based mixing, and certainly some form of it has been going on in theater for a long time. But just to kind of reiterate the context that we are working in today, uh, for these labs is mixing music, right? Mixing music for large-scale sound reinforcement. That's our, that's our thing uh, that we're going to discuss here. So that we're going to try to stay in that framework and that context here. All right. So today we're going to focus on object-based mixing. Uh, so this is kind of the other end of it. We talked about the speaker system and the deployment, how to transport audio out to these systems, how to spatialize it, etc. And now we're going to talk about uh, what happens at the console end, right? Because this is probably just as about it about as meaningful and uh, uh, as complex as all of it. So, you know, uh, today we're going to try to define that concept of object-based versus panning uh, and what those mean for these different types of speaker systems and these different kinds of results, okay? There we go. All right, so as we've been doing, you know, over the past uh, two labs, you know, we've done this big comparison, right, this big comparative study of kind of mono to stereo, stereo to LCR and LCR to these uh, high resolution immersive speaker systems uh, for object based mixing. Now let's, let's come at it from the console end. So let's take a look at what happens in mono and uh, you know we're all big boys and girls here we're going to kind of get this but it's just to, to drive home the, the context and the point. So in mono we typically take a whole bunch of signals uh, you tell me how many you want I don't care and we're going to bus them down we're going to mix them down to a single bus uh, that is going to go out to our PA system processor and up to a mono speaker system, right? This is where we're going to use deploy a mono speaker system. And the challenge in that always, uh, as in mixing mono for records or mixing mono for PA, I don't care what it is, the challenge is getting separation and uh, getting something where you everything in the mix is intelligible, right? That's the challenge here. And we end up doing this kind of a, kind of a vertical stack of instrumentation. Uh, and, you know, I've always you know, kind of believed, you know, this is kind of what drove, uh, you know, arrangement, everything in music in the early days of this. And when I say early days, I mean 50s, 60s, maybe even partly into the 70s, where, you know, if you go back and examine a lot of those mono recordings, you know, in terms of their complexity in arrangement, they were pretty simple. Uh, and I think that was all in an effort to make it read properly in mono. Uh, because the more things you put in it, the more demands are, are are kind of accrued in terms of what you need to do in terms of frequency separation. You know, what what do I feature? What do I not feature? You know, et cetera. It makes it tough to do it. So uh, no different in live sound. And as a matter of fact, I think in live sound, it's even more of a challenge to some degree because uh, we're very casual with how many instruments we put on stage. I mean, you, you go to a big HOW worship show and uh, you might see, you know, six acoustic guitars put in place there you know so uh you know try to get some separation and see who's playing what in those kind of situations it's very very tough to do all right so let's carry on here we'll we'll get to stereo uh obviously stereo is a similar deal right we're going to take a whole bunch of sources and we're going to bust them down to two channel stereo out to a processor two speaker systems in play uh, and, you know, as I was, as I kind of made the case for over the last couple of things, you know, this is where we, I don't want to say we get into trouble, but we have to start realizing some real physical challenges of doing large format stereo, right, where there's a large distance between the left, right. You know, it makes horizontal coverage consistency very difficult to do uh, because we inherently create some comb filtering on the things that are created in the center, right? The things that are in the center of that image that are a function of two speaker systems arriving at the same time, equal amplitude, however you want to look at it. As we start to drift left and right, that comb filter is going to cause some problems for those center sources, right? 
Uh, and it, as, it, just to drive home the point, you know, when we're in smaller environments, studios, even movie theaters, et cetera, you know, not as big an issue, right? Just because the offset is not so deep in terms of frequency response or not so wide in terms of frequency response. But in concert sound, this is, this is a considerable challenge, right? So that's what we're aiming for is uh, some resolution here. So let's take a look at panning in a stereo environment. We're all familiar with this, the pan knob. Right, and depending on what system is delivering the audio to this speaker system, you can have different uh, scales of deep uh, center down points. Right, it can be minus two, minus three, minus four, depending on what system. I know even in the live sound console market, some some systems have a different, uh, you know, down point center down point than other systems. So it's something to be aware of. Right. <clears throat> so in this situation, you might you know using the pan knob you're going to kind of place things in this stereo field. And, and this is not a hardened, hardened rule that I'm placing up here. It's just a, you know, just a raw example to kind of say that this is how we might place things or might pan things, I should say, in a stereo field. And the thing to take note here again is that the things that are in the center are a function of two speakers adding together, right? And as we drift left or right, it's a matter of changing amplitude from one of those speakers to the other and creating the movement, right, or the placement of it. Everybody good with that so far? Anything debatable there for anyone? Makes sense. It's all good. All right. All right, let's take a look at uh, LCR. Uh, in this situation, I, we're going to work with three speaker systems. This can be, you know, the front field part of, an, of a 5.1 system, 7.1, 9.1. This is com you know, commonly what you would see in broadcast and in post mixing today uh, where there's an LCR. And uh, in this situation, it's just an additional bus output, a center bus output, as opposed to just a left right. So we have an L, C, and an R, and we're going to take a, any number of inputs and we're going to mix them down and bus them appropriately to that LCR, right? So <clears throat> in this situation, I'm g and it, for this first example, we're going to talk about LCR being 100% divergent, right? We talked about this uh, in the previous speaker systems. And really, all the divergence means in this uh, setting is that if I have something that is panned center on the console, it is only going to show up out of the C speaker system, right? 100% divergent. So what does that mean to us with regard to how this works in immersive versus stereo, etc.? Well, for one thing, right? If we have all of the elements that are centered in our mix only exiting one speaker system, we've essentially eliminated that comb filter challenge as we walk horizontally, right? Now it's only coming from one speaker system. The, the apparent acoustic phase will be much, much better. And, you know, if we can get that center array to cover a wide swath of imagery, you know, in, in terms of its phase, it's going to be way better and, uh, you know, not kind of gouged to get to death with with comb filter, okay? Now, it doesn't mean we sacrifice panning as we, uh, as we pan it left, we can certainly take it left. If we wanna pan it right, we can certainly take it all the way right. But in the center, it's only coming out of the center. When you have something pan center, it's only coming out center, okay? Let me get back to it, yeah. All right, let's talk about 50% divergent, right? Which is, uh, kind of what I, I, you know, I did for a many, many years uh, with line source, and I was running that at 50% divergent. So in terms of what does that mean for the pan knob? Well, if I have something that is panned center, it is actually coming out equal energy in all three arrays. Okay, that's how I was, you know, accomplishing the coverage, essentially. And, uh, you know, kind of the, the thing you can get from that is that things that are centered now suffer less of that comb filtering because the distance between the two arrays that you're hearing is actually offset. It's actually smaller now. So that's one of the advantages of it. Uh, but, you know, really, and that's in, you know, I was kind of hybriding systems that we have today to try to do this kind of thing. I, you know, as I mentioned last week, if I had it to do all over again, in hindsight, hindsight being 20, 2020, I might actually try 100% divergence with some spatialization in it. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes here. But I, I just thought it would be interesting to bring this up kind of as a point of reference. All right, so same sort of thing. As we pan left here, things go left. As we pan right, things go right. But if we're in the center, all things are in the center, right? 
are only are, are in I'm sorry the center panning is in all three arrays all right so now let's talk about uh, some spatialization right now now we're talking about a very very different world obviously uh, in terms of how much audio gets transported up to the spatializer notice if we're talking about objects now if we're talking about multi-channel objects here we're talking and let's just use the numbers 64 outputs 96 outputs whatever we want it to be those outputs will then be pushed up to the spatializer where it where we will place them in the speaker system field right in this situation we have five across the front we could have seven across the front we could have nine across the front we could have ten across the front. it doesn't matter all you're increasing is resolution at that point because the spacing between any two arrays is decreasing every time you add more arrays so at, stick with me here as I talk about positioning that hopefully will make more sense to you but the other piece of it that we have to deal with in spatialization um, is how do we fold this down right obviously if we're in that kind of front field immersive well in an arena for music remember we're talking about music here large-scale music in an arena I'm gonna have outfills I'm gonna have fills out of the 270 I might have front fills so how do I get that information down there and have it be meaningful right so uh, you can do spatialized mono out to these places that delay time matrix those sources back to their proper position in the front field uh, if we want to do, you know, fold down and still keep some spatialization, which I'm going to try to demonstrate to you today, we can do that in binaural. We can do a binaural simulation. Uh, we can also fold that down to any, you know, X.1 surround. But we want the spatializer to do that, right? We want that to handle those duties. Now, with regard to regular fold downs, fold downs for stereo, fold downs for mono, maybe you're building reference mixes, maybe you're streaming mono or stereo my belief is that in those situations I actually want the console to do that I, I don't necessarily want the spatializer to do that I can do those fold downs right on the console if I want to do that and that still gives me the ability to do some you know if I want to do some mastering style compression I want to do some overall EQ on the mix that's going to the fold down I can very easily do that at the console uh, but what you should pick up on here you know immediately uh, is that in spatialization, right? It, I, don't crucify me for saying this, but there is no mix bus. Certainly at the console level, there's no mix bus, right? So, you, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a trade off here. Now, of course, there is a quote unquote mix bus inside the spatializer. So, gain structure still is important, don't get me wrong there. But our ability to manipulate in terms of dynamics or tone shaping or anything like that. All of the sources as a whole at the console is given away. We're, we're going to kind of give that away or we're going to give it up in chunks uh, in order to get it up to the spatialization. So, you know, as I've preached to you guys in all these labs, you know, audio is managing trade-offs. You know, what are we trading off? And as we talked about even in the speaker systems with immersive and this kind of idea of, you know, placing instrumentation out in these disparate speaker systems, we're actually trading some mix impulse acoustically for some intelligibility and better phase response. That's the trade-off right there. Because remember we talked about if we're, depending on where you are horizontally in the room, you're going to have arrival times of certain instruments compared to other instruments be different compared to other people in the room. People that are in center are going to have a very, you know, a very uh, a, pulled together mix in terms of a time relationship between the speaker systems but as you get off to the side you're going to hear the elements that are in that side a little earlier than you hear in the center elements so it's going to it's going to break apart that mix impulse just a little bit uh, but again as I kind of stated last week I, I think for a live performance where we're watching somebody perform and we're actually building localization in that our brain says that's okay our brain is going to be okay with that in the studio we would not be okay with it we definitely would not accept those kind of time offsets. But I think in, in live sound, and I may be proven wrong with it, I, I don't have enough experience with it to say it empirically, but I just the little bit of experience I've had with it, I've really noticed that your brain heals that up pretty good and accepts it because the phase, the overall phase, the overall response of the individual instruments you're hearing is so much better uh, in terms of, you know, just acoustic phase. So that's where we're going to go next. Let's talk about some... Um, some object-based positioning here. Remember, our pan knob has gone away now. 
So we're essentially just talking about position. Where are we going to position this object? And remember, any object on the console is essentially going to be any combination of things. It can be a direct output from the fader from a, and from an input fader. So if you had 96 inputs on the console, you could make 96 direct outputs post-fader, post-processing, directly to the spatializer and spatialize every object in your console. Uh, you can also obviously break that down into buses. You could say, okay, well, I'm, I'm just going to treat my horn section as one group and just send a group of the horns out and spatialize that and then just place the group anywhere in the space. So you can do that to kind of minimize it and make it a little easier to manage, obviously, but uh, the, the potential is there to spatialize every element of it. Uh, I think, you know, I, what the, and I'm going to make this case going forward. I think for music mixing in particular, we can take some cues from the movie Post folks who, who might be dealing with hundreds upon hundreds of objects in a film mix. I think I gave the example uh, last lab of every bullet <laughs> that is fired from a gun is an object in a film mix, right? So to try to manage all of those as, as independent objects is kind of brutal. So a lot of times what they'll do is build a 5.1 mix and then support it with objects. And I'm going to actually suggest that to you today that we build either a stereo or a, um, I think preferably an LCR mix and then support it with objects if we want to be able to work quickly because there's some advantages to be done with that. So here's, uh, here's our objects. So we can just start placing objects in the spatializer. We can do this at the console level or at the spatializer level. We can just start placing them out there. And again, this is no hard and fast rule here. This is just saying this is where we place them and this is how we hear them, right? So it, <clears throat> this also gives us the ability very easily if we want to build surround, right? Uh, build beyond the front field, immersive field. Uh, then we can also place objects out there too. It's just as simple as pushing them out there and putting them where we want to put them in the space. For objects, uh, obviously, we can place them anywhere in that space that we want to do it very easily. Again, right at the channel level of the console, or we can do it in the spatializer. Either way, we have good control of that right now, even though it could be greatly improved. Uh, one of the other advantages that we get with spatialization is this concept of putting a tracker on someone as well, right? Uh, this is really, really effective for spoken word. I, I have seen this just be an incredible engagement with spoken word, but I uh, I don't know if I gave you guys the example of this from uh, on the last one. I went to see Lord uh, in Oakland Coliseum, and you know it was a very kind of stark looking show. It was primarily her, you know, I mean she was the visual uh, with kind of a darkened backline and, and background. So, you know, when she was singing, I mean it was just this enormous, you know, fifty foot high vocal image. But when she went way off to the side of the stage, you know, the image stayed in the center of the room and she went off to the side of the stage. And I remember sitting there watching it just thinking, oh my gosh, if they had the tracker on her right now, I mean, it would just be so incredibly engaging to watch that happen. But, you know, things like spoken word for corporate, spoken word for houses of worship, where you might see somebody walking left to right in a stage. When you hear this tracked versus non-tracked, it, it just becomes a no-brainer. You just go, I, I absolutely want to hear this tracked. Right now, whether we use it for music or not, I, I'm still very undecided on that. I think in the right setting, you could use it for music. Would I use it for every? Would I put one on everybody so the guitars are going over here and the bass player is going over here, etc.? I, I probably would not. You know, I think, you know, from an audio perspective, we need a few more anchors than that when we're listening to it. But uh, in certain instances, I would certainly consider it. And the fact that we can do it and have it have it happen so. Uh, eloquently and effectively is pretty impressive in this day and age. All right, uh, let's see, what have I got next? Oh, this was the augmented. So this is kind of what I was talking about with LCR and then augmenting it uh, with, um, uh, with objects, right? Which we can very easily do, right? So in LCR, we would just take the left bus, the C bus, and the R bus and make those objects, right? We would just create the, that output as three objects and place them accordingly in the immersive field, right? So whether the left is in the far speaker or the one next to it, et cetera, you have that decision. You can make that decision at any point. Uh, but the, for my money, the, the best part of doing LCR augmented with objects is that anything is in the C, remember, is not a function of phantom image now. It's not a function of two sources, two speaker sources adding together. It's, it's heading out of a single source. So 
Uh, if we can get that CBUS to be, you know, more than likely the most powerful array in the array and get it to cover a very wide portion of the horizontal, this could actually work really, really good, I believe. But it, it puts some power demands on that center array for sure. So obviously I would do this 100% divergent, meaning anything I have pan center is only in the center. Uh, anything that goes left is left. Anything that goes right is right. And then we can support that with objects. So if we think about just the LCR for a second though, let's think about the panning that happens there, right? Uh, obviously anything I have in the center is in the center. And then as I start to pan left and right, it is a function of summation of that center and that left array, right? We are creating acoustic center there, a phantom image again, I should say, uh, there. So, you know, we want to be wary of that. We, you know, if we're going to place things in that area, we might be better off placing them actually as objects at that point, right? So <clears throat> if we go back then to our LCR, you know, maybe putting those things that are there as objects, that's going to increase the resolution of those signals because they won't be subject to the comb filtering in the acoustic space created by the L plus C or the R plus C, right? Is everybody buying that? Kind of getting the idea there, right? And one of the things that's gonna help us do, uh, I think, is it's gonna help us build mixes quicker. Uh, so, you know, if we went to, uh, you know, if we had to walk up and go to work, uh, you know, at an immersive thing, you know, with a, with a blank console, let's say, Man, uh, the last thing I'd want to be doing is trying to build 96 output objects and placing them and putting them out there. You know, give me something that is a little more bus related music wise so I can build an LCR bus of my my fundamentals of the music. Maybe it's bass and drums and, you know, whatever. And then I'm going to support it with object placement, maybe even depending on where people are on stage to try to create some localization and a little more engagement there. Right. Also gives us the ability, if we're using LCR plus object, to be able to place objects out in the, out in the surround field willy-nilly as well, right? Okay, so let's, uh, let's just kind of jump into talking some, about some uh, pluses and minuses of uh, object-based, and then we'll start listening to some audio here. So, um, you know, any com as I mentioned, any combination of individual or grouped objects can be sent up as... Uh, objects to the spatialization. Uh, panning, unless you're doing a, you know, an augmented, uh, is replaced by the concept of positioning now, right? We don't necessarily think panning left to right, we think positioning. And, and as you'll see, once we get to the spatializer, there's, there's actually more to it than going left, right, center, or behind. You know, we can actually create some depth, depth. we can push things back a little bit. Uh, there is a third axis that we can work with there that we don't have with stereo for sure. We also have the ability to create width uh, of an object, and you know I'll just uh, give, the, give away the punchline early here. You know one of the, one of the experiments I've been doing a lot with object is you know what do I do with stereo objects, right? If I have if I have a stereo reverb on something, what does that mean in object-based mixing? Because stereo really doesn't mean anything there for the most part, and. Um, I think what I've kind of landed on, believe it or not, I've kind of come back to mono reverbs that are placed with the instrumentation just to cre create an element of depth. Maybe it's just even to enhance the sonic sign signature of that source and place it right there. And, and what I've been finding, this is my own research here, is that it's much easier seemingly to read the reverbs and the spaces in mono in immersive than it is in stereo. It can get very confusing in stereo, unless you're just going to create one stereo field for everything, which you can do in the spatializer, by the way. Then having all these kind of divided up stereo fields everywhere feels kind of odd to me. I, it just sounds kind of odd to me. Whereas if it's a, you know, if it's the drums, then I've got a, a, a mono or a very wide mono space right behind it. My horns over here, I build some space behind that, etc., and and kind of do my thing with it. And that just seems to read a little better to me. I, but I, Again, I, I'm all new to this. I, I'm easily as new to this as probably everybody in the room. So we're all kind of getting our feet wet on it. Uh, I, I'm, I can't wait to hear back from you guys when you get a chance to use this and what you're doing. Uh, as I mentioned, the ability to create depth is possible here. And this is something I was really, especially for rock and pop music, I was really kind of, uh, I doubted that I was going to use this much. I could totally see it for orchestral and, you know, for pops and things like that. 
But for pop music and rock music, I didn't really think I would use this, but I, I have found that I use it all the time now. Like just creating a very small amount of space. And, you know, I do it primarily because everything that we're working with in live sound typically is close mic'd. There's n really no sense of space on it anyway. So if we can just push things back, you know, just a couple of feet or whatever it is in the mix, all of a sudden our rhythm elements, everything just kind of can kind of just sit better in the mix if we can create that element of depth to it. It's all, I, I, I equate it to, rightly or wrongly, I equate it to using an ambient mic and a close mic in the studio. You know, very rarely do you only use the close mic in studio recordings. There's an element of ambient mics or there's a mic that's farther away from the element to get a little bit of room in it. You can do that with the spatializer with the depth control, you know, you can, and, and you can dictate what the space even sounds like. So uh, it's a pretty cool item. I, I, I find myself using it a bunch. Uh, cool thing about it is implementing a traditional LCR bus. You can even implement stereo or mono. You want to go back to those and implement those in this. You can certainly do those as objects. I, I don't think you really are taking, you know, benefit or advantage of all of the, the coolness of spatialization and all the positives of it if you do that. But I think LCR is the only viable option for me. I know if I was going to do it, that's probably the only bus-driven workflow I would do in spatialization. Uh, this is one of the tough ones. This is, I probably ans you know, I am asked about this more than anything uh, when the discussion turns to doing this. And it's from guys, I mean, let's face it, guys, we've been in an environment now for a live sound environment for 20 plus years, maybe longer, 30 plus years, where we've kind of morphed from... Uh, um, so realize that like, I just want to be able to present a document that goes, this is how delicate operates. This is the way that we think about money, which we haven't done. Like, I see. Okay. Yeah, I'll get him. Hang on. <laughs> so we, we could all listen in on the delicate strategy there if we want to do it. I don't, don't think we need to do that. Where was I? What was I saying? Oh, yeah, bus driven. So what I was saying was, you know, over the past 20, 30 years, we... Uh, as mixers have been kind of driven by what's going on in the studio in terms of bus compression, bus equalization, all of this stuff happening at the bus level. And the question that I get from a lot of guys is, well, do we just have to sacrifice all of that now when we go to spatialization? And the answer is kind of yes, kind of no, right? I mean, if we're going to go to completely, you know, segmented, or I shouldn't say, I should use the word discrete, probably discrete object-based mixing where we might have 64, 96 elements, then yes, we give up the ability to impact all of those inputs at one time with equalization or dynamics. That's the sacrifice, right? But there are ways, and the hybrid way is the way to do it, right? The augmented way where I create an LCR bus where I can have stuff bus together, or I create a, a drum bus, which is I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you today, doing parallel compression for drums and then you know, adding effects to it, et cetera, but still working in the immersive environment, right? So I'm going to create objects that are the parallel paths. You follow me there? So I might have my drum mix. My parallel path of drums is also going to be an object. I'm going to add that in there. And you can do that really as many times as you want as well. There's, there's no penalty there as long as you keep it all coherent coming out of the console. You know, you want to be, pay very close attention to latency offsets there. All right, so, you know, uh, it's not that you have to sacrifice it. You just have to be more clever if you're going to use bus-driven uh, concepts and overall equalization concepts. Then it, then it gets tougher. Uh, this is kind of a cool thing. Uh, you know, I, I get, I'm getting asked more and more about this as we go along. And, but, it, you know, certainly in the live sound portion of it, before we actually send this audio anywhere, in the live sound portion of it, there's no encoding and decoding required here, which is really, really cool. You know, we don't have to have specialized input capabilities on the console to handle, you know, and build objects. We don't have to have specialized output capabilities, meaning some sort of 5.1 or, you know, X.1 X encode to get it somewhere. You know, that doesn't really demand that. Now, as we start shipping it off to somewhere, maybe if we're going out to the Internet or we're going to broadcast or something like that, then, then we start to have to worry about complexity here because, you know, obviously we're not going to send, you know, a 96-channel object-based mix to NBC and have them broadcast it. That's not going to happen at this point, you know. So, you know, there has to be some sort of encode 
that's going to happen in order to be able to get it to a consumer to be able to hear it, you know. No, nobody's stereo has got 96 discrete input <laughs> to be able to hear it in your room, right? So, uh, so the whole encode, out, uh, encode decode for the public is a little different deal. <coughs> Excuse me, man. But it's all stuff that's going to have to be dealt with at some point. Now, the nice thing on the spatializers that are out there today, most of them offer that encode process, right? Uh, where you can fold something down to 5.1 or, or whatever you need to do. Even, you can fold down to stereo off of them as well and deliver that if you're at a show where you're mixing like this and you need to deliver something to, you know, to broadcast to be able to, to deal with it. Uh, there is ways to do it right out of the encoder if we're going to do it. Or, yeah, right out of the spatializer. Uh, and also, as I said earlier, I think, you know, traditional mono and stereo outputs, I think, are actually better created on the console. And again, I'll say this in the context of music, because there we can treat it much more like a traditional bus-driven workflow. We can actually create a mix bus. Uh, it follows along post-fader, just like what we're doing. We will have to monitor it to see if it's folding down correctly and, and be okay. But, you know, I, I think I'm, I think... I think at this point I'm better off with trying to do it out of the console than I am out of the spatializer, but I, you know, I could be wrong with that. Now here's the other you know, trick of the tail here that we have to be aware of here. Uh, you guys know that I've been on this crusade about latency, inter-console latency. Oops. Uh, and that we have to manage that. We have to get that where you know, inputs are all leaving the console at the same time. That absolutely applies uh, for spatialization as well, because their time relationship between inputs coming into the spatializer is very important, especially if you're going to build, you know, spatialized mono for fills, things like that, because it's basing its information in the in the time delay and the amplitude matrix on those things arriving at the same time. So, you know, you can really get it out of whack here if your console is not coherent in terms of inputs leaving the console to the spatializer at the same time. So if you have inserts built that are building offsets between inputs, I'd be very careful there, especially especially so, and no different than in stereo here, especially so if we've got groups of inputs that are all exiting the same speaker system, those inputs should be coherent with each other. I mean, they just have to be to create the right impulse and, you know, decrease cancellation between them. It's got to happen. Right, and then, of course, we have the added issue of ADC now. ADC actually becomes a little bit of a, a tangled web if we're doing immersive because uh, if you take a look at how automatic delay compensation is happening in some consoles, even the one I'm sitting in front of here with Avid now, that delay compensation is taking place very far downstream. It's, it's based on a bus-driven workflow. So for instance, in our situation with Avid, you know, our ADC is built upon that realignment taking place at the master bus. So does that mean all of my direct outputs are actually leaving at the same time? It's not a guarantee by any stretch, especially if we're if we're grouping things, etc. So you have to be cognizant of it. You have to be able to look out for the traps that you're setting yourself uh, in terms of, you know, time offsets between these inputs. I, I mean, I think you'll hear it, at least I would hope you would hear it, going through the PA system if you ever create them. But be careful, again, using ADC. It may not actually align for your spatialization. It'll only align at the mix bus. It'll help you out for your fold down, for sure, but be careful with it, okay? Got some labs coming up in the next, the next two or three, maybe, somewhere around there where I'm going to really dig in on automatic delay compensation and show you how that's working and how it's not working, okay? So I'll give you the little promo for that. All right, so let's think about some consideration for some future developments here, right? So, you know, if spatialization for music mixing is going to become a reality, it's going to force the console manufacturers to come up with some new strategies for grouping, right? So, for instance, I mean, the first one that comes to me is, well, if we're direct outputting to the spatialization, then really, if I'm group, even if I'm VCA grouping, if I'm going to VCA a group of drums, Really, what I want to do is, is group the, de, uh, the direct outs, not the faders. It's all going to be post-fader anyway. And that's going to allow me to retain my post-fader gain structure up into the auxes, right? I'll be able to mix those direct outs, turn them up, down as I needed, 
uh, without really, if I want to do it as level offset, not have any negative ramifications to, to gain structure like we've talked about in the past. So, you know, that's one example of it. Uh, certainly, um, you know, we, we might end up with a situation where we have to use something like a VCA style grouping that also offers some, side of, some sort of, you know, gross equalization on the inputs that we have grouped together. That's certainly possible. I've, I mean, I've seen that. That kind of thing has been done in the past. Uh, I think the example I brought up previously was on the AMAC consoles. I think it was on the AMAC Einstein. If you had their virtual dynamics, that was all VCA-driven dynamics and equalization. So uh, it is possible to do it. We'll obviously have some new extensions of virtual sound check. This is kind of an exciting piece of it. Uh, I mean, today we're going to be listening in playback and monitoring, hopefully in binaural. Hopefully binaural is going to go across Zoom okay here. Uh, so, you know, in order to build mixes, I mean, building mixes for an immersive show now versus building for a stereo show is a very, very different animal, especially if you're going to present it to the client. All kinds of things. I mean, there's all kinds of things we could do here. Uh, to enhance that experience, right? Where we could, you know, say, okay, this is what it's going to sound like in this seat. We could get down to that that kind of presentation for people uh, trying to build it in binaural so that they could listen to it. So virtual sound check is for real. Yeah, I would strongly suggest anybody who is setting up for an immersive show, you know, get into virtual sound check and get a sense of what's going on. Because the other piece of it, and this is not to dog it, but you know, in terms of interconnection and managing signals, it's pretty messy right now. I mean, it can be pretty tough to deal with right now. There's a lot of duplicate work that goes on in the spatializer that's going on in the console, uh, et cetera. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's time exhaustive. So be, be prepared for it if you're going to do it. The, the other one, obviously, in the, logistically, in the, in the near term, for sure, is that we're going to have to find an easy way at the console level, let alone the spatializer level, but at the console level, to move back and forth between stereo mixes and immersive mixes. I, I mean, only the, probably the highest level tours are going to be going out, you know, if they're going to use immersive, are going to be out with the same system every single day. But I would, con I would content you, even then, they're going to have to deal with it because even a show that goes out that's maybe has booked all immersive for arenas, some place is going to hit a festival and need to get back down to left, right at some point and be able to do that effectively. And, you know, I, I, I can kind of envision that in my head and think, man, that's going to be a tough day if we're sitting and mixing in immersive for the entire tour. And then all of a sudden we pull into, you know, Bonnaroo and we're on a left, right, no sound check, just go line check. Here we go. That could end up being a pretty tough day for you. So, uh, you know, obviously at the console level, I think we need to, uh, you know, start addressing some of those concepts as well. And it'll all kind of just self-fuel as this gets more and more popular, the more demand there will be to do it. <clears throat> this is an interesting one here, and I, I'm surprised how much I've struggled to get people to buy into this concept of it. But, uh, you know, this is especially true for full immersive where we have a full surround of immersive is that when we have things going on in the show and we start placing objects out in the different areas of the room if we're recording this and it's going to go to post how do we get the post engineers to understand where those positions were because if they don't know it there's going to be a lot of conflicting ambient information in their mix if they're going to take something that I've placed off to my left and behind and they in post, they think, well, hang on, I don't want to put it there. I'm going to put it over here. Well, they're still going to have an ambient footprint, an ambient signature of this in the ambience mics over there. So, you know, I, I personally think that we need to get them to the point where they can start where we left off in terms of the placement. And then if they if they want to do it, they can do it at their own peril from there. But what that's going to require is some data logging, right? We're going to have to get some uh, oh, I'm spacing the term. Thank you. Somebody help me out. Going to have to get some uh, metadata. Of, thank you very much. Metadata of all of those inputs and where they are placed in the field. Michael Fraley's got his hand up. I'm going to let him go. Wouldn't it be easier to uh, just record, you know, the six line outs from the console and then let the 
recording engineer handle that in post? Well, that, that would certainly be the easiest. I don't think any post engineer that's mixing for, you know, for, you know, some sort of release for whatever it's going to be is going to want to just going to say, yes, I'm going to accept all of your drum mixes, all of your guitar placements, everything. I mean, you know, I mean, the argument you're making is, why don't I just give the broadcasters a stereo mix and they can just deal with that? It's the same same argument. I don't think they would. I don't think they would accept it. Okay. Yep. Uh, let's see here. So, yeah. Here's the other question, obviously, too. And there's a lot of discussion going on, a lot of churn on this going on in the post world. Uh, I've mentioned a couple times, I've met in the past with the Netflix guys to discuss this, uh, etc. is where do we put our ambient mics, right? Especially for music concerts, where do we put our ambient mics to support full surround immersive? Do we place a lot of mics in the surround or do we centrally locate them at the mix position and then place the objects, like if we had maybe a, a 12 element microphone at the center position, do we place all 12 elements out in the spatial field? And I, I don't know that there's, the, I don't know we have the total answer on that yet. I, I know there's arguments for both. Now, I, obviously the challenge with it is that the PA system is corrupting the microphones, right? I mean, in terms of time relationship, the best time relationship is gonna put be to put one microphone system at a central location in the center of the room and record ambience there. The problem is it records all of the PA system there as well. So the ratio of signal to noise, meaning PA to audience, actually can be pretty poor there, right? Whereas if we space mics out around the arena and get the microphones themselves closer to the audience, you know, even though they might be, end up being closer to the PA at times, uh, that has a net effect of more audience the problem is, as you fold it down, the time relationship of all those microphones is horrible, right? So there's a big, big push and pull on there. I, uh, I got a feeling, <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it, but I got a feeling given that we're so channel rich and it's so easy to record more and more, we're going to do both. I think there's going to end up being both where the, the distributed microphone ring for the, for the surround, for the house, will be used in the immersive broadcast. And then the folded down, you know, they'll just go back to a stereo or, you know, a, a simple four channel ambience right in the center of the room and use that in the fold down, you know. So it makes more sense in terms of the bleed into that microphone from the PA system and its time relationship to the actual mix. So very, very complex thinking really there. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard nut to crack. Let's see, what else we got here? Anything else there? I think that's going to be about it. Yeah. All right, so um, I'll stop there for a few questions if you want, and then we'll, I'll just get in and show you some stuff in terms of uh, just some music and placing. We'll talk a little bit about mono and stereo reverb. We're just coming up on the hour, so I think we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes to do this. So, any questions so far? Any, anything make you squirm and say, hang on a second? If I may, Robert. Yeah, please, go ahead. Um, I've been watching you for a few years now, the way you mix and the way you talk about how you treat your, your left, right boss to the mains. Yeah. And it makes me wonder, I mean, cause you use like Poltec and all this yep. awesome stuff to make your, your stereo bus, you know, reach that awesome dynamic. I mean, uh, once we go into immersive, what are you going to be doing about that? I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's the problem don't, don't, don't say that come on you, you're my hero <laughs> you've summed up the problem in one question there yeah no i mean that is a challenge i mean it's absolutely a challenge and i don't know whether the answer is going to be that we're going to need to rely on the spatializers to be able to give us that ability because there is a there is a bus there it's not necessarily a mixed bus per se because it's all distributed but I, you know at some point we're going to need Music-wise, we're going to probably need to rely on the console to achieve that or the spatializer to achieve that. I, I know I would much rather have it happen at the console level than I would at the spatializer. You know, if I can keep my hands out of there for the most part, especially during the show, I think that's better. So Okay, I'm going to keep watching you. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, like I said, we're all still kind of green at this right now, so we're still figuring it out. Do, Maybe, I, do I hear a new app being made? Oh, uh, well, something. Do I do a new plug-in, rather? Sorry. I don't know if it'll be a plug-in, but it, I think it will end up being, my, my guess is it'll be some way to link channels 
and create kind of an aggregate equalization on it. I, I think that'll be the first step. So, Matt McQuaid. Yeah, just a quick question I wanted to ask the room. Um, I like the idea of what you said as far as uh, if you're you know, doing a mono source of the mono reverb. Have any of the manufacturers done any kind of linking yet on the consoles where you could link an object to a reverb and then pan both those at the same time? You know, has I, that been thought of yet? You can do that now uh, with the spatial. Like I could do that in El, the Elisa processor that I'm going to show you today. You can link objects and move them as a unit around the room. And you know, the the one thing that kind of uh, that I heard them do in their demo that kind of what's the word, man? It kind of tripped me out. I, I remember just thinking, wow, I, I don't know which one of those I prefer. Was they did a spoken word right where they had a person speaking and walking left to right. And you had two choices, right? You had it where it was kind of an acoustic simulation where as he spoke, the ambience was happening in the room. And as he moved, you could kind of tell that the, you know, the, the first reflections got a little heavier over here as he moved to this side, as he moved over here, the first reflections picked up a little more, very much more like an actual acoustic environment. So that was one. And then the, the second demo that they gave was building an, a little bit of reverberant space right behind his vocal. And as he moved, so did the reverb that was behind his vocal. And that was, there was a part of that that was even more engaging to me. I, I just remember thinking, wow, I'm really conflicted here on which one of those I would choose to do here, you know? So, you know, the answer is, I don't know. You know, all bets are off at this point. But, I mean, incredible to have those two options to you, for sure. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And then it becomes best used. So that's great. Sure, sure. Uh, Mark Shotwell, go ahead, man. Hey, I had a question going back to the, the hybrid um, panning uh, uh, slide you had earlier. Yeah. So what you were talking about placing something, um, if it were between, like, the center and left, placing it instead of panning it. Yeah. So does that mean does that take it out of the LCR bus and just go to that center speaker then? So it's yeah, not a combination then. That's correct. Yeah. So, okay. you know, so then the thing that you have to keep in mind there, right? You have to, if I'm going to fold it down at the console, then I'm going to need a matrix that's going to handle my LCR bus plus my objects, right? Yeah. You might even need to go to an aux bus if you've got more objects huh. than sources in your matrix, right? So, and, and, and again, a, a, you're going to have to pay really close attention to time there. You know, that's going to yeah. be. And then a, a quick aside in that reverb conversation you just had, that's interesting to wrap my head around trying to figure out how to apply effects in a concert setting. You know, if yeah. you use traditional stereo, you know, or ping pong delays or whatever you're doing. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, the coolest thing about it is, you know, like if, even with stereo delay, I mean, that's a great example of it. You just create that as two objects. And man, you can right. make those those delays show up anywhere. Well, I mean, I, I worked with a guitar player who, who delay was kind of his his signature, and I just kind of envision how he would be morphed into a, an immersive thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I just just thinking about how he did that. He, he described his delays as dolphins swimming sideways through time. So, <laughs> um, interesting fellow. But I'm just thinking how that translates now. So yeah. lots to think about. Thank you. Well, you know, and I think like, I mean, look, you know, stereo's got, you know, a 60 year head start here. Right. But I, I think as more and more records get a done, get done with immersive in mind and musicians start creating and writing with immersive in, in, in mind and composing with immersive in mind, that will start to translate out to us where it's like, hey, look at what we did in immersive. Let's try to do this here. Now, obviously, same sort of thing applies where we say, OK, in big live sound. We've got some challenges here, right? Mm -hmm. Propagation oh, yeah. is a real challenge here. You know, we can't put something rhythmically out there and have it work for a huge portion of the audience. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's challenging. I, I mean, I went through this with Rush where I think I might have mentioned this in one of the seminars, you know, where, you know, in Rush, there's lots of arpeggios, a lot of keyboard arpeggios and stuff. And the thing we noticed when we were doing quad with that is if you put that out somewhere in the quad, it depending on where you sat, it felt awful. I mean, it felt wow. awful. It was just like, wow, that is so out of time with the music because of the yeah, propagation difference, right? You get every, yeah, you need to be in just the right spot to make right. it all work. Properly. But if we kept it moving, right? If we had it doing this, if we had it circling, you didn't pick up on it. Interesting. Yeah, it was really, really cool. And you know, you could just have it circling, have an arpeggio circling the room, 
and it was okay. You know, as long as the, as long as the amplitude of it wasn't going crazy. Right. But, you know, then it seemed okay, you know. And same sort of thing with, with Neil drumming, you know, we, we, with the quad. One of the first things I did was during his drum solo, you know, we had these things where these drum hits, particular drum hits, were coming out of the back of the room versus the front of the room. And it really threw him off the first couple times we did in rehearsal. He was like, holy cow, I, wait a minute, you know, I'm hitting it, and I'm hearing it, you know, 400 milliseconds later, you know. But then, you know, I mean, pretty sharp guy, you know. He picked up on it, and he would, every night in the room, you know, he would do the first hit and let it happen, and then he would start playing against that time, you know. Huh. It, it treated it almost like a metronome, you know, where he was bouncing off of and playing against it, and it was just such an incredibly cool effect, you know. I mean, it worked so great. Yeah, we've so, been, I know this is a side note. My son's recently gotten into Rush, so we've been watching lots of old concert videos and so, some incredible stuff there. Yeah, yeah, it's it yeah, it's really good stuff. But, you know, I, my, all to say, we have to be careful with it uh, in big concert sound because of the propagation offsets. I mean, we could change the groove of the music here without a whole lot of effort, you know, if we're not careful, right? Speaking of groove of the music, I noticed with those guys over time, they slowed down the tempo of their tunes a little bit. Yeah. How, had that to do with propagation, age, or size I, of I mean, I don't really think of that any differently than moving something down a half step in key. You know, when you're 65 year old, you know, you're not going to sing those notes anymore. You know, so I, I, I didn't really notice them slowing down, honestly. But I have, you know, I I didn't really watch all that much of their stuff post 2010. Yeah, I think it was know? probably after you were with those guys. Um, yeah. They seemed to everything kind of slow down a little bit. I imagine, it, you know, I asked that question before, but no one seemed to address it but i don't have a perspective on that i gotta say short of, short of just you know moving things down in pitch you know so or down in key signature i should say yeah. uh let's see mark uh, you still got your hand up are you did you have another question or did i leave it up by mistake oh just left up by mistake okay sorry Hello. oh you lowered it. okay all right uh anybody else have questions there before we move on all right, so let's move over to this. Let's see, I can get rid of this now. Actually, I'll leave that up maybe for the console. All right, uh, so this is just some things I pulled together. I, I got this set of demo tracks uh, that we recorded at a trade show, and I just thought I would use these today just to kind of get the, the concept going. This is in the Elisa processor. Uh, and we've got it set up to listen in uh, binaural today, so hopefully that's what I'm transmitting out. If you want to listen on headphones, you might get a sense of this. Uh, so as you can kind of see here, i got a bunch of objects. Oh, Scott Sugden just logged in. Maybe I'm going to let him help me with this. There we go. Let me get Scott in the room. Scott, are you there? I hear a big arena. That means he's close. There he is. Scott Sugden. Paging Scott Sugden. Scott hey, Sugden, Robert, are you in? Hey, I'm here. Sorry, <laughs> I, uh, time zones got in the way. Oh, that's all right. No problem. I, I actually just opened up the processor, so we've been, we just kind of finished the discussion of the immersive concept here. I mean, the uh, object concept. Got it. Hey, there's the right headset. Now you don't hear the arena. Apologize for that. There we go. Thank you. You could probably turn down just a hair, too. I think you'd feel a little bit loud. Yeah, I know. Always mixing. All right. So, uh, so, Scott, what I was just saying to everybody is, you know, I think we're just going to take a look at some instrumentation and some placements here and kind of how to operate, uh, you know, at the console level. Uh, you know, maybe if I can lean on you a little bit to walk us through, uh, you know, some of the capabilities of the Elisa processor. Maybe we can do that. Sure, sure. Let me, uh, I'm going to try to tile some windows here. Stand by. See a little bit of both. So on the venue console, uh, we have control of the objects via plugin. All right, so there's two ways to do this uh, currently. Uh, we can do it via plugin on the console, which I have an Elisa plugin inserted on any object that I want to use it on. Uh, the cool thing about it is I don't have to have an object. 
uh, I don't have to have a, the plugin inserted on an object to actually use it in the processor. I just have to have the plugin inserted on the object to control it. Okay. I can always go to the processor and control an object regardless of what's happening on the console. It's bi-directional, meaning I can control the object on the console or you can control the same object in the spatializer and they, they track each other. Okay. So um, maybe what we'll do here first is just talk about uh, some drum things. So let's actually, let's do this. Because that's always the question everybody has. Let me get to, let me get to these drums. Hey, Robert, so just to, to clarify, so inserting the ELISA processor on the, uh, on the individual instruments, that create, that turns them into objects then? No, you can use. No, it, it's if you take the direct output of the channel and send it to the spatializer, and have it recognized, it's an object. The only thing the Elisa insert does for you is give you control of that object in the spatializer. Got it. Okay. Uh, let's see here if I can get this. I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little clunky here, so bear with me. This session's a little messy. Let's see where we got this. And I'm working on a remote computer here. It's not the most elegant. Are you guys anywhere near being able to do that on the console level? I, well, again, I, I am or doing can it on you the console. not answer? No, well, look at the screen. I, I am doing it on the console level. That's my point. See that? Uh, I'm in the wrong view. I'm in the speaker view. Hang on. I'm sorry. So you should see the venue screen on on screen right now. Yeah. No, I so, I had swapped the screen view. So yeah. So those are those. That's object control at the console level, and then as I pull this in, this is object control at Elisa. So while Robert does that, I'll jump in and and narrate here a bit. Um, what we have is, if you will, on any individual channel on the console, you would see the individual pan. Uh, or left, right position, front, back position, up, down position. But then on the Elise overview screen, you'd see your whole mix, right? So that's the way you would be able to quickly see what 40, 50, 60, 70 objects are doing together. So here's a way where, where you might want to have uh, an overview screen adjacent to you to see the whole mix, but you're not actually going to edit much there necessarily if you've got control of it on the SXL or console of choice. Um, uh, that's that's where you might want to have the, the two different views here, for example. All right, so what I'm going to pull up for you here first is four channels, okay? So, uh, and we have a, a, a full, um, kind of a full immersive built here, right? So you can see I have five front field arrays and five surround arrays here. That's what we're using to kind of create the binaural thing here. All right. So uh, in this situation, and, and again, this is where you can use busing to your advantage to try to help you place things uh, how you want it. Uh, I could take these elements and create it in the center speaker system only or in the left right speaker system only. Uh, you know, I could do any combination of those. So what I've got right now is a, a single object that is, or I should say a pair of single objects that is carrying the kick, snare, and the tom-toms, and the tom-toms are panned within those two outputs. Everybody follow me there? So that's just a kick, snare, and toms stereo set that are placed as two objects in those two speaker systems. Okay. Then on top of that, I have a parallel version of that, a parallel compressed version of that, and equalized the whole thing of things, that is placed in the same position. So this is a version of parallel process drums in the immersive environment. Now, keep in mind, the center element of this is created by phantom image, right? So if I wanted to do this and keep the phase of it pure, then I would probably create two parallel sets of groups here. I would create one that is the mono set, meaning the kick and the snare, and another one that is stereo toms and place them effectively in the same place, right? So if I did a mono object of kick and snare, you would actually see three objects there. You would see that in the center, and then left and right of it, you would see the tom-toms, if that's how I want to do it. I'm just trying to keep it nice and simple here, right? 
So with that in mind, let's see, let's check our audio here and see if we have some audio. Well, he let me, uh, he admitted me twice so I could go on the mall. He did that, with, he did that while lecturing. All right, so let me just try some audio here. Yeah, okay. All right, I'm going to mute these other elements so that you can just hear this. Try this. Any better? A lot better. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. More better. bueno. More bueno. <laughs> Very when, good. When in doubt, turn it up, huh? Okay. Let's try this. Uh, let's see if this comes through in stereo. Tell me if you just hear the plate here. Let's try this. Making a difference to you guys? Yes, he does. Yeah, yeah. So again, I you know I, I'm not 100% sold either way on it right now, but I it's sure a nice option, nice weapon to have out there because it's very easy to take, as you'll see in the next example here, to take that stereo effect and place it where you want to place it and, to make it the most effective here. So uh, as you can kind of tell, I've got instruments kind of panned out here. I've got you know I've kind of taken the guitar player and put him house or house left. I, I anticipate that's where he was. And same sort of thing with the horn players. I've got the horn players off to the right side a little bit. So it might be worth um, kind of doing this same thing. Let's do the same thing with the horns. Let's do that. That'll be interesting. Uh, so I'm going to mute this for a second. All right, so we got a sax and a trumpet here. Let me get their positions up here so you can see them.
Okay, so, I mean, you get the idea, right? I mean, it's just a matter of placing it where you want to place it. Matter of fact, let's do this. Let's uh, go go back to the uh, the horns here and talk about where we might want to place those reverb returns. Let me get over here. I got somebody, a late arrival here. All right, so I'm going to go to the mono reverb here for a second, and we'll just talk about where we can place this. You know, a fixed environment, a theater environment where you might want to spread some reverb around the room on a given instrument. Sure, why not? You know, I mean, there's no rules here, really, right? I mean, short of just the propagation rules to be careful with. So, again, this is all being handled right from the console here, right? We're just treating it like a pan pot, but it's actually a positioning pot, right? Now, the cool thing we can do with this also, remember, I talked about we can have a depth element to it. Uh, and we have that control right here on the console, too, which is this distance right which means we can push it farther back away from us uh, and this is an actual reverb engine uh, in the L uh, elisa processor that you can control you can make it as big a space or small a space as you want to make it so i have found that actually putting the reverbs back a little bit along with the instruments back a little bit uh, actually helps things sit just a little better it gives them a little more sense of space right so I'll take the solo off here and you can see I've got some elements uh, here that are pushed back from that front line things like drums and stuff I typically are going to have them uh, you know up in the front uh, and just use the actual drum reverb to kind of give some sense of depth there but in terms of close miking other instruments I might want to push those into the actual spatializer reverb there just to get them to sit a little better no different than using distant mics in a recording to get rhythm elements to sit a little better than being this, you know, kind of in your face close mic thing, you know. So same thing applies to the vocal reverbs, everything. It just depends on where you want to place them. Right? Now I'll give you my um little anecdote that is kind of the acid test here. Uh it's really what sold me on doing immersive for live sound. Uh, I think I might have told this story, so forgive me if I'm repeating it. But it was going to see Bon Iver in Santa Barbara Bowl. Uh, and they it's one of those situations where they had two drummers, right? And, man, I'm just telling anybody that's in this room that's tried to mix two drummers in a stereo field, that's as tough as it gets, right? Well, in this situation, they actually took the drummers and panned them out a little bit left and right, or positioned them out is what I should say, a little bit left to right, to mimic where they were on stage. And it was just one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had in terms of walking horizontally, vertically, and being able to absolutely tell with certainty which drummer was playing what part because I could I could kind of localize it. I can wow, the guy on the right is playing with brushes, the guy over here, oh, he's actually on the conga right now. You know, I mean, there was just no doubt about what was going on there. I mean, it was just a beautiful thing. And I just remember thinking, wow, if that handled this that easily, man, I, I'm all in. I mean, I, I want to try this, you know, so. So it was a very, very cool situation. Scott, is there anything else uh, you want to take the guys through some of the features of the spatializer a little bit? I'm sorry we didn't get you hooked up here earlier. I could have given you remote control of this, but yeah, yeah, we, we remember 2020 there, um, or uh, hindsight that is. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I think I think there's a couple of things you pointed out that are great. The the depth effect, um, and I think it's really interesting that you intuitively ended up at giving everything a little bit of distance or depth to begin with as well. And, yeah. and the interesting artifact that does for you is. Of course, um, when you want to solo something, you can bring it forward just in distance as well. So you can remove it from the space a little bit, which tends to focus everyone's attention a little bit. Um, in what's interesting is when you give something distance, it does three things, right? One is if you push it further back, it actually turns it down by default. So it, it automatically makes it a little bit quieter. Um, you can turn on and off that 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 function. The second thing it does is applies a little bit of a, a 
high frequency roll off just like distance does by nature you can turn that on and off as well and the third thing is that's where it engages the room or the space more so as you go further back it engages the reverb engine so if you were playing something you go further away it'll get a little bit quieter it'll get a little bit duller and it'll engage the room a bit more yeah. i.e. how nature yeah. works um but it's a neat way to mix where you go oh i want to give something a solo or attention you can bring it forward which will take it out of the room a little bit which draws everyone's focus to it just that little bit more. Yeah. It doesn't take much to make it really, really effective, you know? No. The other thing, which we didn't really talk about, but is also effective, and I, I've noticed this being really effective on mono reverbs and space, is to give it some width, yeah. right? Which I, I actually kind of equate to weight. It just gives it some weight. So if you notice, I'm going to push the mono drum room back here uh, just so you can see it as much as anything, and then put some width on it. And you can see that you can actually widen its output into multiple places there, right? If you want to give that some more weight, you can do it. So it becomes that kind of, I think I've coined this phrase, it becomes wide mono, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a pretty cool feature to have at your disposal for music mix there for sure. Yeah, it's quite a neat thing. I mean, and the width parameter on the Elise engine um, attempts its best to not affect the tonal response. So when you apply yeah. width, it doesn't get thicker. Uh, it just gets fatter, I guess. Um, maybe that's the right way to put it. Um, is that how my waistline works? Hang on. Yeah, this is, exactly, exactly. Um, but uh, uh, and it, it does that through a, a combination of different things. But uh, functionally, for a live show, as you apply more um, energy, you're going to get some summation from multiple arrays, and it compensates for that as you do that. So right. Um, right. there is a limit to how wide you can make something, so you can't make it 360 wide. So if for whatever reason you wanted to do that effect, you'd have to replicate the object four times yeah. um, and place it at quadrants and then give them all maximum width. But uh, um, it can be a quite a nice thing for background singers, for horns, for effects. Yeah, I noticed it working great for horns, for sure. There's something really right about that. I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> I don't know why, but as soon as I started using it there, I was like, okay, that's really working for horns. Although I'm not using it, what you're hearing here, but I have done it in the past. So. Yeah, I think every horn player automatically plays in a room that has a certain amount of space and ambience to it. So maybe that's just uh, uh, what is what is correct in our brains. Sure, sure. Well, let's uh, let's hear from you guys here. I, I've been talking for ninety minutes non-solid here or non-stop here. So, uh, you know, how is this kind of hitting you? Is this you kind of thinking this is something you want to dig into? You want to, you know, is there other stuff that we should do to show you here? Yeah, yeah, let me hear back from you here a little bit. What scares you? What gives you encouragement? If I may ask a question about Elisa. Yeah. I, I never seen it before, you know, obviously. Uh, what's, I see the dots with numbers and I see a solid dot. What's that, what is that telling me right there? Uh, Scott, I'll I, let you yeah, take it. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that. So um, in Elisa is the spatializer that has up to 96 inputs. So the number is just the number of, of the object input. Um, the, the solid versus empty one is Robert selected number 50, so we can see the one highlighted right now. Um, and then lastly, he's got the little visual solo on, so we can make them all mask or not mask. Because um, we might want to look at just a drum kit, for example, and see that, that information. So there's a, the ability to visually solo or acoustically solo. Um, so think of this uh, in Elisa, you always mix based on uh, uh, Cartier, uh, pardon me, uh, the panorama around you, so the ideal listener mixed position, if you will. So in this case, Robert's mixed everything within a 90 degree panorama for the front. He's got surround speakers in his profile or in his setup as well, um, but there's nothing back there at the moment. Um, and and what you're seeing then is the placement of all, what about 55, 60 objects, Robert? So it's not quite that many. There's some, I, I did get a chance to completely clean this up before the thing started today. So uh, there's some objects in there that are actually not being used. Sure. Yeah, and so so we're we are seeing the the X number of objects that are being used, and, and they can be placed all around the panorama. Um, then what Robert's also doing today is he's got a beta release of the next version of Elisa that has the binaural output capability that some of you are, or some of you are not hearing, depending on how your Zoom setup is. Um, but you can render that sound space to up to 57 speakers, or as few as two for a pair of headphones and binaural, um, which is a, a pretty cool little trick to have. All right, cool. Thank you, Scott. I get it now. All right, so I'm just going to push some stuff into the surround here just for a second. Hey, Robert Dennis has had his hand up. 
Uh, oh, okay. Dennis, Dennis P. Is that Dennis? Yeah. The Dennis P. I know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, are you hiding your last name for a reason? There, are you are you uh, right from the law? No, no, no. Okay. So my question is this: When you use the width, does it actually spread it from? Like right now, I see it's in the center cluster, and then it goes wide. So it goes into the other clusters. Is that what the width does? Uh, I believe that is correct. It can. So, be. so then my question would be: Is let's just say that. Uh, the center cluster is not quite capable of doing your kick and snare and lead vocal and bass the way you want. So could you spread the width of your those elements that need more impact or more volume to do it that way without uh, getting into some weird uh, phase and, and, and stuff like that, Scott? I, yeah. That, Go ahead, wondering. Scott. I'll, I'll Dennis, let you take it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you can, yes. Um, now, once again, if you apply width to something, you are taking away its ability to have um, l direct localization because you're making it less poignant, right? So that's the compromise as a sound engineer you might have to make. Okay. Um, and, and that is always a challenge. No different than if you were to put the kick drum equally between what would be two arrays in Eliza, it'll it'll distribute that energy to both those arrays. However, the concern is going to be at that point that you're starting to create some narrowing in low frequency. So it's a balance you're going to play in in your parameters the one challenge of every immersive system right is going to be that if you don't have an unlimited budget each of those arrays you're going to have will be inherently smaller than the original left and right and you're not mixing in mostly mono and so therefore you don't get that total power scenario the same so if you think of like a heavy electronic music there's that one moment in the show where it's 100 percent kick drum that's the hardest thing for an immersive platform to do Right, because to get there, you'd have to have each array actually 150% the size of a left and right, um, and that's probably budgetarily challenging. Um, albeit, uh, every one of us right now would probably go fly all those speakers if we could. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's that's the challenge. But if you apply width, you can gain some power. It's not a huge gain, right? Um, because at some point, the energy becomes uh, uh, it's not coherent energy always. So it's not a, a, a great return on that investment. So I wouldn't necessarily strategize that uh, approach for that purpose, but it will give you some more power, yes. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Does dis Scott, does distance separating between the stacks affect that energy or affect uh, null cancellation? Sure, do two kids in a pool jumping at a different point yeah. create different waves? Of course, right? So. Um, so in, in the Elisa with algorithm, we do some decorrelation. So there is a diminished or no comb filter, but it's not a perfect science, right? Um, the Elisa render or the, the engine itself is not using per se um, any, there's no time component to it. So it's not like it's a specific distance offset that's going to be problematic. Um, from the design perspective, which Robert and I talked about a month ago or so, we, we look at it from that design side. So if we manage it correct on the design, then it mitigates any challenges that exist at the show for mix. And the whole objective here is to give the engineer, to give Robert, to give the band um, the creative freedom and license to not have to worry about that. Right. So if we do a good job on the front end of design, we don't have to worry about that when we get to the show. And you just mix and go, I think this sounds right. And it should <laughs> translate well. Um, and that's kind of the objective. Anybody else there? All right, so here's something to consider, right? In this mix that I built here, uh, obviously I've created some bust, meaning aux bus out to processing to return drums, right? For the for the spank, for the for the parallel compression. So those, without doing anything, are latent of the other objects, right? So I have to do some time alignment there. Right? You would have to do that here. So if you're going to create that kind of bus-driven workflow, you've got to find ways to uh, get your sources coherent. Again, those, those are outputs or those are objects that are going to leave the same speaker system without question. So if you haven't picked up on the whole concept of latency and phase alignment of your console, I encourage you to dig in. It's going to snake bite you if you don't do it. I think you guys know where I stand on that by now. Well, there's only five of us left in the room, so I, I'll answer uh, any more questions. Then I got to run off to another meeting here. So, 
All right, I'm going to let you all go then. An hour and 40 minutes, that's kind of rocking. I didn't think we were going to go that long today, but there you go. Scott, thank you very much for joining in right at the end there. I very much appreciate it. Absolutely good to see you, Robert. Thanks, yep. everyone. And, See you later, uh, Robert. Thank you. Guys, we'll catch Thanks, you Robert. in a couple of weeks. All right. Next time, Robert. Thank All right. you. Thanks, Robert. Thank, Thank you, Robert. Robert. You bet. Thank we'll you. see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Robert.